there. I'm going to spend some time today talking about political competition in Iran, and I will just encourage you to try and connect as much as you can uh, what I talk about uh, in this lecture with your understanding uh, for, of Iran's regime and of the ways in which um, different institutions are more accountable to theocratic uh, demands or to um, secular demands. Uh, let's start with political parties. Uh, this is a unique system in which there really are not strongly institutionalized political parties. In the um, Under the Shah, before the revolution, uh, political parties are very, very tightly restricted. Um, and after the revolution, there's actually this appearance of a lot of new political organizing. Um, some of the banned parties are going to reemerge. Uh, you're going to see the creation of some new political parties. Um, but then there will be one party called the Islamic Republican Party, which is very closely allied with Khomeini and with the theocratic leadership, uh, which really dominates in the 1980 elections. Um, and then subsequently, both domestic political strife and the context of the Iran-Iraq war are going, are going to justify increasing um, crackdowns on political parties. And even the Islamic Republican Party will be disbanded in 1987, all of which is a long way of saying that today in Iran, there are really not institutionalized political parties in the way that we see in any of our other, in all of our other case study countries. Um, there are two, that isn't to say that everybody in Iran, obviously, agrees about politics, and there are particularly two major issues um, about which political elites and candidates for office tend to disagree. Question number one is, how should this regime be structured? How much power exactly should the clergy be able to exercise? What institutions should they control? Uh, where should they leave, you know, more def be more deferential to the will of the people as expressed through elections? And the second major issue is, how is it should uh, that Iran should manage its economy? Um, what degree of interference should the state be uh, performing in economic activity? Um, Iran has uh, kind of two broadly defined factions, although of course this is an oversimplification and different people's opinions will differ uh, beyond these broad strokes. But there are two kind of big big picture divisions uh, that you need to know about. One group in Iranian politics is known as the principalists, as in we want to return to the key principles of the Islamic revolution in 1979. These are uh, conservatives who generally speaking favor a stronger role for the clergy. They also tend to prefer a more statist economy. And it's worth remembering here um, that increasing the degree of state protection for the poor was a core demand of the Iranian revolution. And there's a lot of elements of the 1979 constitution that attempt to promise more protections for social welfare. Um, that group of principalists is sometimes called, mostly by outside commentators, uh, hardliners. I try to avoid that terminology because I don't think it's super helpful, but you'll hear it in a lot of writing about Iran. The other group opposed to the principalists that tends to be active in Iranian politics is known as the reformists. These are relative moderates who call for incremental democratic reforms, um, and they also tend to favor economic liberalization, although again there's some disagreement within this camp about exactly how to manage Iran's economy, particularly in the age of um, extensive international sanctions. Um, Two additional notes to make about this. Number one, you might be instinctively inclined to say that the clergy, the religious authorities, must all support the principalists, but this isn't actually true. There are significant political and theological divisions among the Shia clergy in Iran, uh, and there are some clergy who actually argue from an explicitly religious standpoint that, this, that uh, the theocracy should actually be weaker, that the clergy should be less involved in day-to-day -day politics. Second thing to note is that you will also note there is no established faction in Iranian politics um, calling for radical reform, calling for a totally secular democracy, or calling for the return of the Shah, or calling for whatever other sweeping change you might be able to imagine. That's not because there aren't people who, that, that's not because nobody believes that in Iran. It's because the um, Guardian Council and the other theocratic institutions in the structure of the state generally eliminate those positions from serious contention for elected office. So there certainly are radicals in Iran, but they generally have significant uh, obstacles to expressing their opinions freely, or it's be able to, to have a realistic shot at being elected to office, which is why when we start analyzing, you know, matchless elections or presidential candidates, um, generally the distinctions are going to boil, boil down to this kind of limited selection of principalist versus reformists. Um, in the absence of political parties, we do see these temporary electoral coalitions uh, formed generally in the advance of any given matchless election every four years. These are groups that endorse particular lists of candidates in different districts, but they're not institutionalized political parties. 
parties. They don't form lasting connections between candidates and, and constituents in the same way that real political parties do. Um, they tend to dissolve between elections or to change their name or fall apart. Um, and it's actually possible for candidates to be endorsed by multiple coalitions. So sometimes if you are looking at um, you know, news coverage of a uh, Majlis campaign in Iran, uh, you will see that such and such candidates are endorsed by such and such coalition, um, but that lacks many of the defining features of a strongly institutionalized party. And it might be worth, uh, given what you know about political parties elsewhere in the AP COPCOV countries, spending some time thinking about whether this is a feature of Iranian politics, which is likely to make it more or less democratic. Um, the lack of institutionalized political parties, though, does not mean that there has been no competition in Iran. Um, again, this is one of the misconceptions that I tend to spend a lot of time uh, struggling against in my class. And I think I can illustrate that there has been some real contention for political power through elections by just walking you through the last 20 so or so years of Iran's political history. I'm going to group these. Uh, I'm going to group this timeline by presidential uh, administration. Uh, but it's worth noting that Majlis elections happened the year before pr the presidential election and the general trend in the period that I'm going to describe um, has been for if reformists are going to win a Majlis election, a reformist candidate will generally win uh, the subsequent presidential election. So I'm just using presidents um, to give you reference points, but do note that there are you know, significant changes in the balance of power in the legislature as well. Uh, so we're going to start this brief history in the year 1997, um, when a reformist candidate named Mohammad Khatami wins uh, the presidential election with more than 70% of the vote, which is really quite significant. Um, Khatami is himself a cleric, again, worth remembering uh, that not all clerics are principalists in Iranian politics. Um, and he generally falls on the side of some degree of sort of cultural and political liberalization. He explicitly says we need more civil society groups in Iran. Um, he calls for a greater degree of cultural uh, and media freedom. He's going to lift initially some restrictions on the media. He's going to lift some restrictions on Iran's film industry. Um, he will appoint the first female cabinet minister in Iran since the 1979 revolution. Um, he even, it appears, endorses a plan to open political negotiations with the, with the United States, which ultimately the U.S. is going to shoot down in the wake of 9-11 and then the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, However, uh, after, so Khatami's reformist victory is going to be confirmed um, by a huge, huge victory for reformist candidates in the 2000 elections to Majlis, right before Khatami is going to go up for re-election. Um, but this is actually going to trigger a backlash by the theocratic side of the Iranian state. Um, and so starting in 2000, uh, you're going to see those institutions act to start restricting press freedom, uh, to block some elements of Khatami's proposed reforms, to violently shut down student protests, um, to shoot down reformist bills that are passed out of the Majlis through the Guardian Council. Um, at one point, the Supreme Leader is actually going to actively tell the Majlis, you can't even discuss this new law that would liberalize the press, which is a degree of direct personal intervention in legislative politics that had not previously happened in post-revolutionary Iran. The other um, thing that really kind of hobbles Khatami's efforts at reform is that he makes kind of a conscious decision to pursue cultural and political reform at the expense of economic reform. Um, and as Iran's economy stagnates in his second term, as unemployment increases, um, this is going to lead to disillusionment among reform-minded voters. Iran limits presidents to serving two consecutive terms, so Khatami can't run for re-election in 2005. And then in 2005, with that presidential election, you're going to see the pendulum swing in the other direction. In that election, a principalist candidate named Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is going to win uh, the election. Ahmadinejad comes from this relatively humble background. His family's not super wealthy or well-connected. Um, he joins the Revolutionary Guard and serves in, I think, as an engineer in the late 1980s for a couple of years during the Iran-Iraq War. Um, then he advances. He has this political career uh, in the provinces, and he's elected mayor of Tehran, of the capital, in 2003, which is a good example of how those local elections can actually be a way for politicians politicians to build their base and to rise to national prominence, because only two years later, he'll be successfully elected as president. Ahmadinejad's support in that election is going to come primarily from a few groups, religious conservatives, uh, lower income voters who feel like he's going to stand up for them, um, and the security forces, uh, the Revolutionary Guard and the Besiege in particular. And of course, there's a fair amount of overlap between those three groups. Um, Ahmadinejad's policies are going to be populist on the domestic front and aggressive on the international front. At home, he's going to call for a lot more state aid to the poor, and he can connect that call for to uh, the political principles of the Iranian 
Iranian revolution. Um, and that's going to help explain a good deal of his popular support. Um, turning to foreign policy, he's going to be very aggressive in terms of promoting this idea that Iran has been um, conspired against by uh, other countries, by the international community, particularly the United States and Israel. Um, he's going to use very hostile rhetoric, particularly against those two countries. And he's also going to push the development of Iran's um, nuclear weapons program, even though it's not under his direct control, that's under the remit of the Supreme Leader. Um, and so he will be highly, highly controversial on the international stage. Uh, American presidents in particular are not huge fans of, of Ahmadinejad. Um, and he is going to be fairly popular with his domestic base, but he's also going to risk some degree of instability, um, particularly through his inflammatory foreign policy rhetoric. Uh, and that's going to make the Supreme Leader and some other you know, stability promoting figures in the theocracy uh, kind of wonder whether Ahmadinejad is in fact a suitable leader. The other thing that really is going to tarnish Ahmadinejad's legacy is what happens in the 2009 presidential election when he runs for his second term as president. Um, he is opposing in that uh, he is opposed in that election by a reformist named Mir Hossein Mousavi, um, who is polling pretty well. He is making these demands for more women's rights, for more press freedom, for more democratic reforms in Iran, and polling in the run up to the two th to the first round of voting in 2009 makes it look as if Mousavi is doing well and that he will at least make it to a runoff against Ahmadinejad. Remember that Iranian presidents need a majority of votes cast in order to win. Uh, and so it's fairly common for there to be a second round election in that system. But instead, they count the votes in a kind of um, unorthodox way. There's a lot, a lot of suspicion that this vote count is fraudulent. And then sudden, suddenly the government announces, actually, Ahmadinejad won an outright majority. He got 60% of the vote in the first round. No need for a second round election. Ahmadinejad has been re-elected. And so the widespread belief that these results were cooked in some way led to a massive uh, street protest movement in Iran that's known as the Green Movement, or sometimes your textbook calls it the Green Wave. Um, so large, large numbers of protesters come out in the streets calling for Ahmadinejad to step down, um, using Mousavi as their figurehead. Um, Mousavi is going to be put under house arrest, uh, where he remains for many years, I think to this day, in fact, um, and the protests are going to be met with violent repression. Uh, the police and the besieged kill an estimated 150 protesters uh, and detain another thousand in the course of these protests. That said, it's worth noting that even though Ahmadinejad is a hardliner, he wants more support for the conservative elements, for the clerical elements uh, of Iran's government. He wants a stronger theocracy in Iran. It's also just kind of worth noting that the supreme leader himself is not necessarily totally enamored of Ahmadinejad, in part because his popularity makes it seem as if he might be able to get an independent base of power that could ultimately threaten the supreme leader and other political elites in Iran. And so it might not surprise us that in 2013, the pendulum is once again going to swing in the opposite direction with the election of a moderate nun named Hassan Rouhani. Um, there is a ton of uh, weeding out of candidates. The Guardian Council is particularly active in the run-up to 2013 election. They even eliminate a former president from uh, from um, candidacy uh, in this election. Um, so you can kind of tell that in this cycle, the theocracy is particularly interested in maintaining some degree of stability. Rouhani uh, promises stability. His previous job was as the chief nuclear negotiator for Iran, trying to get out from international sanctions that are related to Iran's military uh, nuclear program. Um, and he comes to office basically promising, I'm going to stabilize the country and I'm going to ensure a recovery from these crippling economic sanctions that have been imposed on us. And indeed, the most significant achievement of his two terms as president is that he negotiates a deal with the Obama administration, with the European Union, and with a couple of other uh, major players in international politics as well, in which he says Iran will agree to constrain his its nuclear program um, in exchange for relaxed economic sanctions. And so the hope is that this will lead to an influence flux of foreign investment, that this will help Iran's economy recovers. Um, on social and cultural issues, Rouhani is also uh, a lot less of a, a hardliner than Ahmadinejad is. So he's going to call for uh, freer internet access. He's going to call for the besieged to kind of back down its morality police functions. Um, he's going to call for the liberalization of Iran's press law. Um, but, and this is a theme, that this is something that he had in common with Khatami, um, he doesn't have a ton of success here because he doesn't, as president, ultimately control the judiciary or the security security services. And so the sort of uh, cultural political impact of those proposals is going to be somewhat limited. Um, Rouhani is going to take a lot of political damage in his second term. Um, 
Donald Trump's administration in the United States will unilaterally pull out of the nuclear deal and reimpose sanctions on Iran. That in turn is going to lead to another deterioration in the economic situation in Iran. Those hopes that Iran's economy would recover, that people would be able to find jobs, that the cost of goods would, would go down. None of those are really fulfilled in Rouhani's second term. Um, and there's actually massive protests over really, really bread and but butter issues, including specifically the price of eggs, the price of gasoline, um, that damage Rouhani's popularity and legitimacy. And then, of course, the COVID pandemic, when it spreads to Iran and hits Iran particularly hard in its early days, um, is also going to damage the idea that he has been an effective leader. But in any case, he's going to hit his term limit in 2021. Um, and the new president inaugurated just this month, as I'm recording this, is Ibrahim Raisi. Raisi had previously been a, the chief justice, the head of Iran's judiciary. Um, he's generally perceived as being allied with Supreme Leader Khamenei. Um, culturally, he's fairly conservative. And there was really no question in the run-up to the election that he was going to win, uh, given the number of candidates that had been eliminated by the Guardian Council. Uh, one note and one thing that we heard a lot about Raisi in foreign news coverage of Iran's 2021 election was that in 1988, in the tail at the tail end of the Iran-Iraq War, um, Raisi participated in a four-person committee that proclaimed without due process death sentences for thousands of political prisoners in Iran. Um, and so there are a lot of international organizations and other countries that have branded him um, a violator of human rights or perhaps even a war criminal as a result of his connection to those proceedings. Uh, of course, too soon to really draw definitive conclusions about where his administration is headed. Um, but this, again, I think suggests one last swing of the pendulum in the conservative direction in Iran's presidential politics. One asterisk, of course, is that um, you might want to ask yourself, and I think it's an open question for debate among analysts of Iranian politics, exactly how much does it matter who is elected to the president and who controls the majlis, given the degree of constraints imposed on Iran's elected institutions by its theocratic institutions. So it's important that you know this stuff for the purposes of my class, um, but you're also, you would also be well within your rights to question exactly how much it matters for actual Iranian politics. Finally, let's talk a little bit about civil society and the media. Really hard to separate those things from each other, so I won't try to. Um, civil society really flourishes in the 1990s. A lot of the restrictions on civil society um, that had come in the name of national security during the Iran-Iraq war are going to go away by 1990. Um, and this is part of the reason why Khatami can be elected to the presidency even before he becomes president in 1997. There's all these different civil society organizations um, that are popping up in Iran calling for a, a wide variety of reforms to the system. However, as part of that backlash against this movement, as part of this backlash against Khatami's reforms, um, into the 2000s, hardliners within Iran's governments, uh, particularly after the wake of 9-11 and the Bush administration's decision to designate Iran as part of the axis of evil, you're going to see the theocratic institutions and the security institutions start cracking down on that newfound civil society. So there's been some degree of back and forth here, as there has been in electoral politics. Um, there are still considerable numbers of non-governmental organizations in Iran, um, but they increasingly tend to steer clear of political activism. And we'll talk about constraints on those in just a second. More recently, um, as I keep saying, uh, the social media and increasing access to the internet um, has been a force for organizing civil society and for organizing protests against the governments, against the regime in Iran. Um, one really, really notable example of this happened in 2009 during the Green Revolution. Um, there was a woman named Neda Aga Sultan who was shot and uh, during it during her participation by security services in these protests. Um, and there was you know, pretty widespread video of her death, uh, which circulated in really large numbers um, on social media and incited further protests in Iran. Um, more recently, there have been some uh, protests against Iran's laws requiring hijab, requiring modest dress for women in public. Those have spread primarily online. Um, and then in the 2016 matchless election, um, Instagram and uh, the secure messaging app Telegram uh, were both used to mobilize votes for reform candidates for the Majlis. Um, that said, the regime, I think, continues to have, it's fair to say, the upper hand in repressing the organization of civil society. Uh, here are a couple of ways in which they do it. Um, in 2000, in that backlash to the Khatami reforms, uh, the regime pushed through new press laws uh, that restricted uh, media outlets from criticizing the Islamic Republic. Um, and Iran's courts, Iran's judiciary, uh, has used those laws to impose penalties on journalists, on publications, and in some cases to just altogether revoke the licenses uh, of newspapers or radio stations or magazines uh, to just shut them, uh, shut them down and put them out of business altogether. And it's worth just reminding you, I think, um, that the courts can 
can do this and do prosecute these media outlets, even under relatively liberal or reformist or moderate governments, uh, because the courts are generally controlled by hardliners and are not completely accountable to Iran's elected institutions. More broadly, uh, laws attempting to promote national security to protect the country um, can be and have been used to target uh, non-governmental organizations that get too political. Um, so Iran's laws have thing, include things like bans on anti-Islamic propaganda, uh, bans on conspiring with foreign interests, uh, bans on violating Islamic principles, all of which are pretty broad and vague wordings um, that allow courts to use those laws if they see fit uh, to shut down NGOs that are, in the regime's perspective, getting too political. Um, finally, more recently, um, Iran's government has used its control over the internet, its ability to regulate internet service providers, its ability to slow down the internet throughout the country um, to try and shut down or at least constrain the impact of uh, social media being used uh, for political mobilizing purposes. So you've seen specific apps uh, that have been banned in Iran over the years. Uh, Facebook and Twitter are key examples. Um, Telegram, that secure messaging platform, more recently has been banned. Um, the government can also order just total internet shutdowns in specific regions. It even did this nationwide for a week in response to protests in 2019. And again, the decisions about restricting access to the internet largely fall into the hands of the security services and the theocratic institutions rather than Iran's elected institutions. Um, so any law giving the government power um, to constrain people's access to the internet tends to be used for those relatively conservative purposes. I will leave it there. We'll have much more to talk about when I see you next. Thanks.